this is Killer Kyle, and welcome to another episode of Wheels of Fury. As you can tell by the title, it's going to be the best and worst of SummerSlam. Now, we did the first ever best and worst of WrestleMania. Mm. This was a little bit difficult. I don't know why, but it just is. And I don't know why either, because SummerSlam started like right after WrestleMania. Yeah. As, yeah, so. And this year is the 30th anniversary. So that's yep. pretty cool. And, yeah, so this is going to be an interesting one, I guess. So. And I think, really, the thing that has made it so difficult is because, okay, Matt took the liberty of picking the Summer Slams. That it, for best and worst, and of course I'm just fresh back from camp. I just got back earlier this afternoon, so we've just kind of been talking about it just before we started shooting this thing, and kind of doing an overview of highlights of each Summer Slam, and then kind of talk about what we're gonna say during this, and then. Kind of just hope it turns out well. We'll go from there. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we'll start with the best. Okay. So, I'll just go first. Then. So, obviously, if you know me by now, or you watched my videos, I obviously think this was, well, not only one of the best Summer Slams, but the first Summer Slam that I've ever really seen a promos for, and one of the only Summer Slam, well, the only big four pay-per-views out of North America, so, Summer Slam 1992 yep. was pretty cool. I mean, you look at... It was an outdoor event, Wembley Stadium, Wembley Arena, in London, England. I you have, yeah, just beautiful scenery. And oh yeah, if it was, you know, the beginning. I mean, it wasn't really an, an outdoor event, besides probably WrestleMania Eight. Since then, we had WrestleMania Nine, and. Well, many WrestleManias outside. In fact, there's been way too many as of late. I mean, you had Levi Stadium, you had... The uh, Citrus Bowl. Yeah. A lot of other WrestleManias outdoors. I think this past WrestleMania was a lot. You know, it was the first indoor WrestleMania in years. But yeah, I digress. You had one of the best matches. You had Shawn Michaels make a singles debut match as his as the Heartbreak Kid. As the Heartbreak Kid, fresh off his singles run, breaking off from Marty Jannetty of the Rockers. You had sensational Sherry Martel, who was his manager, one of the best. Feuds I could think of was his feud with Bret Hart. Yeah, and for sure. The boulder of which would be months later, but, mm -hmm. you know, Bret Hart versus Tito Santana. You have Legion of Doom face Money Inc. You have Undertaker against Kamala. Well, that was an interesting match. Yeah. And, you know, it just was. Very cool just to see that kind of build. And I don't know, just kind of fun, you know. You have, well, how do I put this? So they say that the WWE title isn't always in the main event. You know, there's other matches that should be in the main event. And this one made no exception. You had. England's own, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, take on Bret Hart and win the Intercontinental title. 
the ongoing feud they had where Brett introduced Diana, his sister, to Davy Boy Smith, and they were married. And, you know, this was kind of a takeoff of that. You had the WWF title with Macho Man Randy Savage and Ultimate Warrior. You know, that was, well, it wasn't one of the best matches, but I digress from that. Mm -hmm. You know, they wrestled at WrestleMania 7. Mm -hmm. I have to say that was the better match of the two. But, yeah, I think, you know, SummerSlam 92 definitely was one of my top whatever number this is going to be. Yeah. List. One thing I found really cool about 92 was the various different concepts they had for wrestlers' entrances. You had the Legion of Doom and Paul Eller riding to the ring on motorcycles. You had The Undertaker riding on the back of a vehicle of some kind. It was a hearse. The Hearst, yes. You had Lennox Lewis lead Davy Boy to the ring mm. with the Union Jack. Yes. And I mean, as little as it is, that's what makes certain pay-per-views interesting. The, the, like, the matches, of course, got to be good. The intrigue of the matches has got to be good. And if you can somehow give the fans... That little extra something to go, hey, I remember that. You know, you go for it. Whether it be the Legion of Doom on the motorcycles, or having Lennox Lewis lead British Bulldog to the ring, or the Undertaker on the back of the Hearst, and whatever else, you know. It, that's what. It may not necessarily be something that you say is your favorite, but it'll definitely be something. That would stand out in your mind as far as something that you could think of to remember the pay-per-view itself. You know, I think about all the, I guess, missed opportunities that the big four pay-per-views had that mm. they could actually go out of the country, go out of North America. You know, you have the Tokyo Dome, you've got the Coliseum in Rome. There was the Bellator fight that we watched. Oh, yeah, it was a Bellator kickboxing in Italy. Yeah. And just that was one of the best sceneries ever. You know, you have Wembley, you've got a lot of these main amazing coliseums or arenas all over the world, you know, and for one reason or another, I mean, yeah, they have pay-per-views elsewhere, like in England or whatever, but they're not the big four. No. And it's kind of unfortunate that way. It needs to come back, it needs to, you know, it would be something fresh. And interesting, and I think that SummerSlam 92 was the best, one of the best, in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. there it is. And you know, with the WWE Network right now, they've had, like, a few special events take place. Well, they've had one take place outside of... North America. Yeah. And they're going to have another one coming up here. Yeah, October. They're going to be in Australia. Yes. And then, of course, they had the greatest Royal Rumble in... Uh, Saudi Arabia. Yes. And that was... <laughs> that was okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that it is only just the beginning, you know. But I think if somehow they can get... Uh, pay-per-view, whether it be SummerSlam, Survivor Series, or Rumble WrestleMania outside of North America, or, e or even just a pay-per-view in general, may get somewhere. Yeah. You never know. So, 
SummerSlam I enjoyed? I would say a SummerSlam that not only was the show itself really good, but you also had other things that really made it enjoyable to watch would be SummerSlam 94. Okay. Where you had Undertaker versus Undertaker. Now see, here's the thing. The premise to this match was Undertaker had a casket match with Yokozuna. And he gets stuffed in the casket, beat up by a bunch of people. It seemed to be a general overall theme that happened to the Undertaker with whatever match he was having. Anyways, they show Paul Bear wheeling out the casket, and then you see up on the screen inside the casket, and the Undertaker and it zooms in on him, and he's talking about not resting in peace and all this other stuff, and then. You see, like, it go kind of like a negative for a photo, and then, like, the casket exploding, and then you still see the image of the Undertaker, then you see him come up from behind the screen, up and up and up and into the heavens or whatever. And then you've got Million Dollar Man saying, hey, I found the Undertaker. He's been missing for however long. I found him. I'm bringing him in. And then you've got Paul Bearer going, Well, that's not the Undertaker. I've found the real Undertaker. And they're going back and forth, which led up to SummerSlam. Now, the thing that I found really kind of entertaining about this whole situation was you cut... Leslie Nielsen, and I don't know really the other dude's name. Yeah, I can't remember the actor's name as well. But it was a naked gun thing anyways. Yeah. It was out uh, in theaters, so one of the naked gun movies. So they were promoting that anyways. Oh well, yeah, they were promoting that, but they basically put Leslie Nielsen and his character, I guess yeah. you could say, on the case of trying to find the Undertaker, and you got like little things backstage. Oh, the Undertaker trail goes this way, and he thinks he sees the Undertaker over here, and it's really the other dude, and all this other stuff. And at one point, you see like you got the two of them out in the arena, and I think they're talking about a naked gun movie, whatever. But then, there's a silhouette in behind them of the Undertaker on like the en the screen to the entrance or whatever it was. And so they, know, they don't realize that it's the silhouette. And so th by the time they turn, it's gone. And then they walk off. And then eventually you end up into... The Undertaker vs. Undertaker match. And the fact that they could get a, another person to portray The Undertaker that was pretty much same height, same build, same length of hair, same overall look with the gloves and the top with the torn sleeves, the tie, the boots, the pants, what have you, really made it interesting. It wasn't until years later it found out that the guy that was opposing Undertaker in this match was actually his cousin. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think his name was Brian Lee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what I found interesting about this one, and I honestly don't remember too much about it, but seeing... Ted DiBiase introduced The Undertaker in his debut to see DiBiase come back and just basically have him 
come down the aisle with the money and you see the Undertaker follow and it, well, the fake Undertaker. Yeah. But I also found it interesting too is that you had one Undertaker with the purple gloves. Mm -hmm. The other Undertaker with gray gloves, yeah. Which basically would be the newer Undertaker outfit anyways, I guess. Yeah. Because Undertaker always seemed to have the purple gloves. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe the newer one. Anyways. So, yeah, I mean, that SummerSlam definitely, there was a lot of cool shit there as well. But Heart and Own Heart wrestled in the steel cage. Yeah. But that was interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. I think their match at WrestleMania was kind of the beginning, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they had one of the best feuds. And fun fact, I was watching, there was, well, they called it Phantom Wrestlers. Wrestlers you didn't know. Mm -hmm were the champion at some point, but it's not on record. And apparently there was a house show where Owen did win the title, but it was like erased from the history books. For whatever reason. So whatever, yeah. So I found, you know, that kind of pisses me off because of what could have been. Mm, but yeah. nonetheless, this one was also a good match. SummerSlam 94 was a pretty cool pay-per-view, and I think it kind of went south a little bit after, mm. after, for a while anyways before I trail off yeah and I'm pretty sure this was the summer slant or I think I think is what it was have million dollar man come out leading the undertaker to the ring with a wad of cash yeah and then you have Paul Bear come out with the that giant urn and he gets into the ring and it goes dark and you see him take off the lid to the urn and there's the light coming out of the urn and he's showing it all around like he's waving it yeah. all around the arena and then boom well, the second Undertaker or whatever comes out and then the match commences so that was an uh, interesting yeah. aspect of the, that particular SummerSlam. For sure. So f the next one for me, it's uh, when I started religiously getting back into wrestling. You know, it was kind of a little dull for me mm. for a couple of years anyway, but... You know, this was kind of getting back into it. 1998. Mm-hmm. SummerSlam, Highway to Hell. You had one of the best feuds of the Texas Boys, Undertaker, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. This was like... It was it just... You know, they were both faces as well. And it was yeah. Interesting, because these guys had a match, and there's one point where... And me, me or may not have talked about it. I know I have. They collided. And somehow, Steve Austin gets knocked out. So he's on his back looking up at the ceiling. Get all happening going, hey, are you alright? And he's like, yeah, knock myself out or whatever. Mm, yeah. So, of course, Austin won this one. And, but it was a really good match, and I remember a lot about it, and thinking that this was, yeah, this was a cool match. Another match that was really awesome, in my opinion, was Triple H and The Rock. Mm -hmm. And there, well, this was, again, uh, one of their many matches, you know, they feuded a lot over the years. Their first encounter, I believe, was a Thursday Night Raw special. Mm. And The Rock, the only time I remember The Rock beating Triple H for the Intercontinental title. Mm. Yeah. So, this match was a ladder match. You got Nation of Domination and Degeneration X. 
and this match was a ladder match. It was very cool. You had the DX band perform for him in the ring. Mm. And then, of course, Nation comes out. And this was really a good match. And, of course, it went to Triple H. But, I mean, at the time, it was awesome. I think politics, or I don't know if it was politics, but it just seems to be that ever since their matches always fell on Triple H. Seemed to be, yeah. And well, there is that one I quit match. Yeah. On Raw, so. However, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of other cool matches in 98 and SummerSlam. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I would say probably one of the more odd and interesting and certainly different Summer Slams because you have the wedding of Elizabeth and Macho Man. And then there was the uh, match with it was Hogan and Warrior versus Slaughter, Colonel Mustafa, I guess, is Iron Sheik. Yeah. yeah. And the other guy. Crazy Eyes. Crazy Eyes. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that really made it so interesting is... Even though they had several other things going on with this pay-per-view, it seemed to be the main focus was what they were calling the match made in heaven, the match made in hell, <laughs> with Randy Savage and Elizabeth, and then that tag match, and it's like, okay, I understand you're really hyping this up, but at the same time, you're putting a little too much emphasis on those two particular occasions. Like, you've got a whole other, like, two hours or whatever that, okay, I'm sure was talked about, but not really hyped up as much. So they were put out there, but it seemed to be the huge focus was <laughs> the wedding with Macho Man and Elizabeth, and then that six man tag match, tag match, whatever it was. What's interesting about this match was knowing that the Ultimate Warrior, Jim Helwig, mm -hmm. Was holding up McMahon for extra money. Yeah. Or he wouldn't go to the ring. Which. Wow. You know. You know. You want to talk about. Honoring a man that did that. There's a lot of shit that is being. Swept under the rug. And we're just going to. Have the warrior award. And I understand that part. It's like he did a lot of petty, stupid shit that I wouldn't let anyone else get away with. At the time, I guess, you know, but it's like, you just don't do that. You don't hold your boss up for more money. I don't think that, you know, especially when you have a room full of people, like, uh, it was just a filled seats and you're not gonna go out? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. You're advertised for the show, and you're basically, moments before you're at the to go out and compete, going to your boss and going, alright, I want X number of dollars, or you can find somebody else, or whatever. I'm not wrestling. Like, as much as I understand him wanting more money, wanting a raise, whatever you want to say. You go about it a different way. You don't 
say, oh, I want this much money, or you can fuck yourself, basically. Yeah, exactly. Now, yes, Warrior did have his moments of not thinking things through fully before he actually did them. And yes, there was the whole issue with him and steroids and shit like that. And I, I don't really think the things are forgotten about, but you take warrior that worked with kids and, you know, did so many other things for WWE, why not make a, a dedicate an award to him and present it to people that are going through battles and struggles and persevering on the other side. Oh, I mean, it's really hard to say, but, you know, it is what it is now. It's. I think the main premise is, okay, as much as Warrior did do some dickish moves, the man had all the intentions in the world, all the right intentions in the world, he just went about it the wrong way. Yeah, and I think, too, I mean, and this isn't an excuse, but if you're willing to try to make amends with the people that you've wronged, I think that, you know what, in my eyes, people can change. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not all, like, not, sometimes you can and sometimes you just can't, but when more, often more than not, you know, people can change. I think. And so, yeah, I think that, I mean, look, if you're gonna sit there and tell me that Shawn Michaels is a dirtbag, you know, then you're a fucking hypocrite. Well, Shawn Michaels pretty much was a dirtbag, yeah. but he was a dirtbag because he's on fucking drugs. True, yes. Once he got off the drugs, that's when he was a complete 180. Yeah. Uh, you know, he had to get clean and sober and do whatever he needed to do, I, I guess, but... Read the Bible and find uh, Christ. Yeah. Essentially. Here is something I just thought of. If Vince McMahon still had a grudge against Warrior, after all those years, for him, you know, saying, oh, I, I'm holding you up for this much money, and, and I'm not wrestling, and the whole steroid issue, and whatever other issues Vince might have had with Warrior, do you think WWE would have put him in the Hall of Fame? Not a fucking chance. No, I, I, and that's the thing, too. I don't think, you know, what the hell do you want? What do you want? Whether have fucking Ultimate Warrior in the Hall of Fame or Chris Benoit. I mean, that's not a good example because it's obviously different circumstances, but you have a lot of these guys who are being accused of certain things, you know, like Austin being a wife beater, you got Jake Roberts being a fucked up cokehead or whatever. And alcoholic. An alcoholic and, yeah, shit like that. You have... Michaels, who fucking did what he did. You have a lot of, you know, Jimmy Snuka, who killed his girlfriend. Whether it was next or not, who fucking knows. And by this point, who fucking cares? Mm. The fact of the matter is, you know, what makes Warrior any different? You know, yeah, he's among those people. And why the WWE, you know, I like a... I'm not going to retract my statement, but you got to give people a second chance. Yeah, I know. And try to give people a second chance. And mm. if they fuck up, then that's it. With the warrior, it was like, okay, Vince fired him, then brought him back, then fired him, then brought him back, then fired him. 
them fish off brought them in. And that was a it was disaster. A fucking disaster. And then you get all these things where I hear, you know, warriors making racist and homophobic bullshit tyrants and whatever. And it's like, do you, you know, okay, fine. You want to take the guy, the warrior, the character, and you want to say, well, this guy he was great to children and he had a great message. So that's all fine and good, I guess. You know, it's kind of, it's it's a hard, it's a hard thing to fucking put together, I guess. I don't know. Like, I understand, but at the same time, that's kind of hard to understand because of the history. I mean, like, like I said before, if you give people a second chance, but there's always going to be that history. And trust. So, but, you know, that's kind of how things are, and, you know, who knows? I mean, Michaels is pretty much a different man than he was back in the oh, 90s. of course he is. So, I guess you could learn from that, too, and that's just the way it is. I mean... Another example is Randy Orton. He was a young kid, 23, 24 years old, in the wrestling business. He's gotten told, oh, he's a third generation superstar. He's one of the best in the business. He's such a natural. He's a diamond in the rough, and one day he'll be world champion, and so on and so forth. And then, yeah, he did get into some drug issues himself biggest thing was because he's hearing all this stuff about being a third generation superstar and he's got the business in his blood and he's a diamond or whatever he ended up with basically an inflated ego mm -hmm. and he thought he could you know get away with whatever and not get reprimanded for it and there were several occasions where Triple H would go, alright kid, you gotta, you know, calm the fuck down before you get yourself into some deep shit. And Randy would pull the old, oh, I'm young and dumb trick, and yeah. Triple H was like, dude, you're fucking 24 years old. When the hell is that? <laughs> where is the line between young, dumb, and naive, and then, like, mature, smart, not so naive. And then eventually Randy ended up with children. Well, he got himself straightened out, had a family, and then once he had a family, he's like, all right, I have to be able to separate the Randy Orton that we see on TV and then Randy Orton, the family man. And um, I think that's hilarious because, I mean, yeah, Triple H came from a different cloth. He's not a third generation or second generation wrestler, but he's the one to talk. I mean, he started when he was, well, he started in a WWF when he was 25 mm -hmm. himself. So he's pretty much gone through his childish phase, you know. I mean, look at the fucking DX thing with Shawn Michaels. You know, well, yeah, it's a different kind of... But here's the thing, though, dude. You're mixing things up. Because you're talking about the things that Triple H did with DX. Okay, yes. There was a lot of very, 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 very controversial things with DX. But the things that DX did was all storylines and you know written in that and there wasn't a risk of one of them getting fired there's shit that randy was doing at some point if he didn't get told to you know calm the hell down and shit he'd be fucking dead or fired or fired so yes dx did some goofy funny entertaining shit 
and some very controversial shit, but they weren't never at risk of getting canned. Randy, I'm sure, at some point, more than once, was at risk of getting canned. And I'm sure Triple H or Ric Flair, whatever, stepped up to bat and go, Hey, let me handle this. I'll take care of it. Don't fire the kid. I'll keep him in line. Whatever. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I understand. But that was, well, that's another long topic. <laughs> Yeah, another so, long rant about something totally not, well, kind of related, but yeah. also not related to what we're talking about here. Right. But, anyways. So, yeah, SummerSlam 91 certainly was one of the more interesting ones, I will say that one. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead because I know this one. You yeah, know, SummerSlam 2002. Mm. Speaking of Shawn Michaels, you know, and this was kind of the debut of one Brock Lesnar and him facing The Rock. Yes. You know, and it was like. One of the more interesting summer slams of this generation because you had, mm. you know, I was just finishing up going to high school, and so it was like my generation kind of was changing a little bit. So you had The Rock, who was the at the time undisputed champion. Mm. And you thought, okay, so this is Brock Lesnar's first few months in the WWF. Mm. I think that's great. I think, you know, are we going to have him win the title right away? Well, who knows? I mean, I didn't think that was possible. The last bout that they had before SummerSlam, it was basically Brock Lesnar beatdown. So, mm. but... In any case, yeah, Brock Lesnar beat The Rock, mm -hmm. and that was a clean finish. Yeah, absolutely. My opinion is this. I think the way they went about it was, you got a guy, six foot four, six foot five, 295 pounds, built like a brick shithouse, young, athletic, strong, it was on a pretty good tear right up until he faced The Rock for the title. It's like, okay, let's put the strap on him and see how far he goes with it and what he can do with it. And it worked out fairly well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Again, this was when Steve Austin, you know, took his ball. And went, yeah, took his ball and went home. home. So to speak. So you needed somebody new, and Brock Lesnar was that guy. He was the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Him being the champion and going on to have feuds with Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero, whoever else. You know, I'm not even going to talk about Zach Gowan. Yeah, but it was. it was just one of the best reign. I guess. I mean, and he was also young. The second youngest WWE champion, I guess. Yeah, I think he was like 25. Yeah. At the time. Yeah, so. And then you have Triple H and Shawn Michaels. You got Shawn Michaels who has been out of action for a long time. You know. Yeah, since ninety nine. Well, ninety eight is yeah. when he stopped wrestling, and then he came back. He was the commissioner, mm -hmm. and then they just shit canned him for drugs and whatever. So, you know, he left his shit together. Yeah, 
But he also laughed because he fucking broke his back. And that too, yeah. <laughs> and the mask was him and Taker in a casket mask, and he goes over the top rope over the casket and fucking twists the wrong way and yeah, crunch. Yeah. Who's just buying? So, you know, so this was kind of like, it was interesting to see that these two had a great history mm. and they came back, I can't remember what paper for it was, they, you know, men's and they came, you know, friends and it was like a long drawn thing and that episode of Raw and then the tease came out and I was happy. Mm. Obviously, I was a huge fan of DX, and you know, it was kind of cool, in a way, because you had no idea that Triple H was going to turn. Right, yeah. And, and so we did, and that was a big shock. Now, had this actually played out, that would have been cool. I mean, yeah, you had DX come back, and I mean, Triple H and Shawn Michaels in 2006 mm. and that was not the same obviously it was a different time but just imagine what they could have done in 2002 oh uh, yeah but you know they, they teased the heel turn and then you know it came out and it was a kind of a shame and in a way I understand because here's a guy that you know Won the WWF undisputed title at WrestleMania, and then fucking loses it to Hulk Hogan. Oh yeah, I forgot Hulk Hogan came back, so we gotta put the title on him. Fucking backlash, we gotta put the title on the old dog. You know, we can't fucking have no. You had your biggest star. And the WWF at the time, you are your biggest star. He should have stayed the champion for as long as he could, but no, because Hogan was back. We have to bow down to the fucking old guy, you know, to do what? So that he can lose the title to The Undertaker? Are you fucking kidding? You know, so, yeah, you did that bullshit, so now we gotta do something else with Triple H. Mm. So... Okay, you know, let's have him turn heel. Because that's, you know, we, we worked up to this whole thing where he won the title and then, and, 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 so whatever. It is, okay, whatever. It is what it is. So, Triple H turned heel. Okay, so you had this match. And I gotta say, this was a really good match. Despite everything I just said, this match with Shawn Michaels and Triple H was pretty good. And I got in. Of course, I'm going to say better than the one in 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I have no idea what to add to that whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think what other matches they had on that card. Yeah, Kurt Angle and Rey Mysterio. Yeah, yeah. And that was pretty cool as well. I mean, you had... This was Kurt Angle's... Well, I, actually, it said it was his first SummerSlam. Right, yes. Again, I thought that was kind of interesting. Because mm -hmm. uh, he's been in the company at the time for a few years. But this was definitely Ray's first SummerSlam. Yeah. And they had such good chemistry. So. Yeah, absolutely. Got Rick Flair, Chris Jericho. And yeah, and Devin Benoit, and then Taker uh, against Ted. The Un-Americans took on Booker T and Goldust. Yes. Booker T and Goldust. Booker T and Goldust. Gold yeah. You know, this is kind of like... And again, talking about the foreign wrestlers, and obviously the Un-Americans were Canadian, but well, mine is William Regal. They really tried to push the envelope, and I thought, how could they, why would they do that? This was like a year shy from 9-11. Yes. You, you know, you really want to toy with that? and Piss people off? They got tasked with the 
upside down stars and stripes. Mm -hmm. and it's just crazy, you know. And I mean, it was like the worst time to do something like that, but they did it, and they were an interesting stable. You know, the one thing I particularly found hilarious about that union was okay, you had Christian, Lance Storm, and Test. Okay, Christian's from Toronto. We got that. Lance Storm was from Calgary, I believe. We got that. <laughs> Wasn't Test from like. Oh, so they brought him from Toronto. Oh. But. And then, of course, William Regal. So, I mean... I, I thought it was only the three of them, Test, Storm, and Kristen. I don't remember Regal part of that. Oh, he came in afterwards. Oh. But... He was, like, the only non-Canadian. But, I mean, again, this was an interesting stable. And it was like, okay, so... Again, we have the Canadians as the heels. That's just kind of weird. Yeah. However, you know, this was cool. It's a shame that they never put the WWE title on test. Yeah. But, again, I don't think they believed in him that much. Well, I mean, the number of times that man bounced around being tag team partners with Alper to a singles run to being a member of the Un-Americans to be doing singles run again to leaving WWE for a little bit and then coming back to WWE around 05, 06 or 06, 07, whatever it was. Yeah. The man never, like, he had some good runs but he never really had something sustainable enough to give him a world title opportunity it just the cards didn't fall in his favor as good of a big man as he was and as good of a wrestler as he was and athletic and all this other shit things just really did not go his way right. i don't know why but it just ended up being that's the way the cookie crumbles as they say yeah for sure I can't believe how much I despise Hogan. I know, it's like you think Hulk Hogan's the world's biggest dick or something. Like, seriously, holy fuck. Seeing as how we went 02, we can go ahead a couple years and go 04. Ah, uh, yes, this one. Yeah, I remember getting this on pay per view. Yeah, you want to talk about Randy Orton and. I'm sorry, but I have to disagree. He wasn't ready for a title shot. I mean, he had the Intercontinental title, and yeah, he's a third generation wrestler, but there's a guy that should not have had the title as early as he did. Mm. I mean, in a way, yeah, I understand that, because you got the feud with Triple H, and him turning heel and leaving evolution mm. but then the whole legend, legend killer gimmick and on and on but, yeah so you got like rob van dam and and then they do pretty and the dudley's against billy kidman paul london and ray mysterio kane against matt hardy john cena against booker t yeah edge against batista and Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle against Eddie Guerrero, Triple H against Eugene. Yeah. Oh boy. You know, and that's the thing too, you got Edge versus Batista. And it's like, that wasn't interesting. And I don't remember too much of that feud, but, you know, you have yeah. John Cena and Booker T, Fast Out of Four series. And so... I think so, yeah. Anyhow, yeah, John Cena won the U.S. title from the Best Out of Four series from Booker T. You've got Kane versus Matt Hardy. And they tell that there was part of the match. 
That was interesting. Yeah. The whole Kane and Matt Hardy feud was just crazy. Oh, like and bizarre and unusual and... You had that, uh, and then you had Kane and Snitsky and... Mm. That was a fucking train wreck. Yep. And then finally, the Kane and Edge, but... This was... Kane and Edge was, wasn't too bad. You know, it's kind of interesting how that worked. Because you think about it, the match... You know, Kane and Edge, and that wedding was pretty cool, but... Mm -hmm. You know, they had some good matches. I was thinking about, actually... Lita in ECW when she was Miss Congeniality. Miss Congeniality. So, yeah, that was, you know, interesting. But yeah, yeah. Kane and Matt Hardy had... An interesting feud as well, and a lot of weddings that year. Yeah, but you know this was cool. Yeah, I mean, like I said, two thousand four was an interesting year for WWE. WrestleMania, I think, was better than SummerSlam, but I definitely remember thinking that it was the wrong time for Orton to change to the be the champion. I think. Then, well, what was even more confusing was the breakup of, you know, him leaving Evolution. So, yeah. interesting. But then, of course, you get the WWE title, which was... GBL and Tinker. So, they had a pretty good feud back then. You know, 2004 Undertaker JBL, that was pretty fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. But, there it is. Yeah. So... Let's go on now to 2001. Okay, yeah, yeah. You've got... Again, fresh on the... Not exactly, you know, this was the starting, I believe, of... WCW and WWF. I believe so, yeah. So... Yeah, Booker T who got defeated by The Rock. You have Edge, who defeated Lance Storm. You have Kurt Angle, who defeated Stone Cold Steve Austin by disqualification. This was kind of... No, I don't know. I mean, I hate disqualifications to begin with, but... Mm. You know, their feud was really cool. And I think that's... Interesting why I put this on the best list, but you know, the match with The Rock and Booker T was awesome. Mm. And, you know, what kind of. I was always a WWF guy, and so I always cheered for them. I thought the alliance was interesting. I don't, again, know why this had to happen, you know. Vince McMahon loves competition so much, yeah. Mm. He defeated his competition, and now he's... Well, if he fucking goes and feuds with TNA, then... Or, sorry, Impact. But he got Jeff Hardy and Ralph Van Dam, who also had a very good match. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this was pretty cool. I thought that the Alliance thing was... It wasn't the greatest, but I don't think it was the worst thing ever. I mean, no. It was an interesting SummerSlam. Yeah, this was in the time when they had a WWF against the Alliance. Yeah. Which... The unity of the Alliance and the whole thing with Shane and Stephanie and then Phil Paul Heyman in there and things that were said and... Just made it all very, very... Interesting. Yeah, for sure. And in a way, kind of disturbing, too. Oh, you could say that. I mean, at the time, Paul Heyman scared the living piss out of me, so... See, Daddy, I just couldn't wait for you to die yeah. to take over the company. I said, oh, I went out and got my own. Like, who the fuck says that to their own father? Uh, what the <laughs> hell? Yeah, that's funny. 
Before we go on to the worst, let's talk about Honorable Mansion. SummerSlam 1989, which was probably one of the bizarrest take teams. It first says Brutus Barber Beefcake and Hulk Hogan. Yes. But, and it was also cool because he had Mr. Perfect, who defeated the Red Rooster, Terry Taylor. Mm -hmm. You had the Ultimate Warrior, who beat Rick Rude. Mm hmm. In for the WWE Intercontinental title. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool to see, you know, you had Ted DiBiase defeating Jimmy Snuka by count out, which not another finish that I enjoy, but this was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, the whole thing with Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake against. Randy Savage and Zeus was this is coming off of the release of No Hold Barred. Yes. And it was kind of a surprise to see why would you take a fictional character? Yeah, wrestling isn't real, but you mm. know. Take a fictional character from the No Hold Barred movies and. Try and make him a wrestler? Yeah. And yeah. Apparently Zeus is a real dick in real life. Mm. I can't remember what his name is, but it's kind of fucking hilarious. Mm -hmm. but Tiny, that's what they, that's what he's called. But yeah, if you want to laugh your ass off, you gotta watch the insane promo with the Macho King and Zeus with Sherry Martell. Mm. You can't understand the fucking word they're saying. Mm. But this was fucking... You know, an interesting summer slime, and this was obviously the end of the 80s, and, you know, it was a different time, and it was awesome, I think that, I don't know, just pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, this is getting pretty long, so we're gonna, that was the best of, and we'll be right back with the worst. The worst. Stick around.